thing. Good. Well, Mark, um, Mark, you're on mute still? Bye, babe. Hey, Mark. Are you? Bye. Mm. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, this is our second webinar. Um, yeah, good time to be doing it during our lockdown because we can't have our face to face meetings. But um, we hope the first one brought some value to, to the attendees, and I hope we can continue this. Um, like Andrew said last week, we're going to try this once a month. And if the need arises, possibly more. Um, today, we're going to speak uh, more around evictions um, on a more specific topic. Uh, I'm pretty sure I don't, I'm speaking for myself only when, when the eviction word comes up in conversation. Um, my blood pressure starts to rise and I try to change the topic quite quickly. Um, I thankfully, Greg for Mark is available. Um, he, he, he's a proven legal expert on evictions and he's ready to talk to us. Um, for as long as he he likes, although I think Greg is similar to I in that uh, in my convo a bit longer. So, without further ado, Greg, could you give us an overview, um, firstly, on what landlords are legally permitted to do during lockdown and maybe post lockdown as well? Um, a practical view on what can be done, and then what we can expect to happen over the next two to three months. Sure, Greg. Thank you. Um, the what happened in the the week or two before lockdown um obviously the everyone was in a state of flux um the courts were starting to close down um starting to move to move um uh into into remote work so what happened was matters that had been set down in the first couple of weeks of, of the hard lockdown were, were pushed out um Happily, quite quickly, the High Court in Joburg got on top of the of the matter and started de de dealing with matters over Zoom or over Microsoft Teams. So quite quickly, certainly by the third week of, of lockdown, the courts were operational again. What one was able to do, contrary to public perception, is one could bring eviction applications. There was no prohibition against that, and we've we've heard several. Since probably the third week of lockdown, we've we've had several matters in court, eviction orders granted, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, what you can't do, what you couldn't do under level five, is you couldn't evict, physically evict. You couldn't send the sheriff along with uh, with with a court order to evict people. Um, in addition, you couldn't execute a warrant of execution. So clearly, the thinking was to avoid physical contact in that in that hard lockdown period now what happened then under under level level four there was a a slight evolution then on level three a slightly bigger evolution which basically had um uh which permitted which which didn't permit evictions unless the court ordered that it was just and equitable to do so so it was a, it was a slight evolution so if you had an an urgent matter um you could ask the court to order that eviction took place or takes place even under level three. Um, the problem, the only real problem that's manifest so far is orders that were granted prior to lockdown that are notionally now executable, but can't be. Because in truth and in fact, it's been a relatively limited problem because the eviction process mostly is quite a long process anyway. The absolute shortest you will get an eviction order is two months, and generally people are given a further month before they they have to vacate. So, any matter launched now, which can be launched now and can be considered now, um, will generally be, you know, some months before um, before eviction date. By which time we will either be out of level three or we'll have moved on completely. Um, we hope and pray, but the um, the the government appear at the moment to be loading level three um, with increasingly new things to open the open the economy. Um, evictions are still um, in that sort of stasis where a court can order an eviction to be to be carried out, but has to expressly do so. So I think the um, I'm having a conversation with Cogta tomorrow 
in which I hope to get some indication of what their intentions are. It took me by surprise when they maintained the um, prohibition of, of evictions under level three. Um, and I hope they don't intend a similar surprise for political ends under, under level two. Um, but we are already in the, in the realm of the ludicrous. You know, if you can have 50 people in a church service and you can't evict a person, quite frankly, the irrationality of it is clear. Okay. That's me, Greg, on so, that point. So, Greg, um, you say now that we can get an eviction order, but we can't um, execute it. And now we're looking at level three, which is going to last possibly another a week, a month, three months, whatever it might be. Um, we can't predict those dates. However, when we spoke the day, you mentioned that if we do get an eviction order now, in level two, it looks like we will be able to execute it. Would it be a good thing to do the eviction order now? Start the process? You know, one of, one of the prejudices I generally run my advice on is if a tenant is wobbling and things are slightly different now, one should, one should move as fast as possible because the eviction process is so long, soon as started, soon as finished. And we'll talk just now about the unusual times. So in general terms, if there is someone for reasons that you have, that you have reached the conclusion needs to be evicted, um, the quicker you start, the quicker you finish. We don't anticipate that a prohibition on evictions is going to last much into July, certainly. Um, so if one had to commence an eviction application now, we would anticipate that one will be permitted to evict again before even one gets that order. In general terms, there may be urgent circumstances, but in those circumstances, the court can and will order execution now, even under level three. That was the one advance from, from level four. So for example, um, we had a housing project that was invaded and we took an order. And in those circumstances, you will ask the court to permit execution prior to the end of level three. Um, and that, that has been set up for that. And uh, you know, that, that is what's likely to happen in those circumstances. So in answer to your question, if you have reached a conclusion that someone needs to be evicted, you should rather start sooner than, than later because one can grind out the court process while that process can be legitimately held and your eviction order will be executed in due course. Sure. Okay. Yeah, so, so the last thing we want to do is landlords is um, um, into, um, into an agreement with the tenant and get to a point where they need to be evicted. Um, of course. For various reasons, um, obvious reasons. So can you give us um, an overview? Um, we want to avoid the situation as best we possibly can. What preventative measures can be taken when we rent kind of, um, a property practically from a signing of lease agreement point of view to managing the tenant if they start to default? Where, where do you sit in terms of what is best practice from the start of the lease to to, to the point where we get to where the tenant is defaulting and we find we don't have a choice anymore? There are obviously um, there are enough, there are some initial points. Careful credit control is, is key. Um, taking of a double deposit is key because as I mentioned, the eviction process is a minimum of three months and you don't want to, you want to minimize the prospect of, of loss during during that period now of course we're talking about normal times we'll talk about abnormal times just now um the i've i've never seen a good landlord tenant relationship be punished with with a building hijack now that is an extreme example um in general terms people will pay their rent we all we all hear stories of the professional debtors the professional squatters who will get into a property with no intention of ever paying rental and you know those those are mostly a suburban phenomenon and one and one sees them in general terms a tenant goes into a lease expecting and intending to pay rental as they then do generally 
the last thing a tenant won't pay is their rent. Whatever other compromises they have to make, they will continue paying their rent because the place where they stay is fundamental to their well-being and that of their of their family. So we've all seen political rent boycotts. We've all seen commercially inspired rent boycotts. We've all seen out and out attempts at hijack um, in in the inner city. So those do happen. But in general terms, if a tenant feels that they have access to um, someone's ear that will that will listen to them if they've got a problem and engage with them, that makes for a much happier environment. The other point that I must mention, Greg, we discussed yesterday, is the um, Consumer Protection Act. The, the Consumer Protection Act and the impact of a 20-day breach period only applies during the fixed period of the lease, which means that it may be in one's interests to sign a, a six month or maybe a year initial period followed by the, um, the lease continuing on terms decided in advance, which means in turn that you will move out of the fixed term period, which means you can then reflect in your lease that outside the fixed period, you're on to a seven day breach period because you know 20 days, 20 business days as required by the CPA is a month. You end up with a an endless rolling of this month, uh, this month of breach, which isn't, which is, which isn't desirable. So I think, you know, my suggestion would be move out of the fixed term as quickly as you can, because then at least you can be in a seven day breach period so that you can move quickly should you need to. Sure. Other than that, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. I'm not expert in tenant relations. I just witness from the side, the, the, um, Landlords who have the ear of their of their tenants and vice versa are generally insulated from from the worst problems that one does see. Yes, yeah, so so I think speaking from a landlord perspective um, and the audience here, you know, there, there's a lot of different types of landlords from somebody with one property to mm. people with ten thousand properties as a corporate um, and then managing properties too. I think lease agreements sit somewhere in a gray area because legal jargon and the way you guys talk and write and the way we talk and write and then our tenants, there's a bit of a disconnect there. Um, we discussed briefly a summary of the lease agreement signed and basically a list to say, these are the terms, you know, you're signing a six month lease, you owe the rent by a certain date. Would you, would you suggest that that would be attached to the lease agreement? Would you suggest that that kind of a document would work in favor of preventing an eviction? Um, or do you think that that's just um, a statutory thing that you do in the beginning that generally doesn't go anywhere with evictions? To be, to be frank, I've never seen a real problem with the nature of the lease agreement should one get to eviction stage. Um, you know, the, the TPN lease is well constructed and is, and is useful. Um, you don't even need a lease agreement. I mean, there is pressure, the, the National, the, the Rental Housing Act and the Tribunal, I'm sure Mark will talk about that. There's increasing pressure for there to be a written lease, given the perception that that will give the consumer a higher degree of protection, and that may well be the case. Um, but in truth, someone occupying your property with your permission and paying your rental, that's all you need for a lease. And that's quite frankly, or we would need ultimately to evict someone if we had to. So, you know, I, we don't need too much formality. Is there an occupation of your property? Yes. Is it by agreement? Yes. Is the tenant, is the occupier meant to pay rent? Yes. That's a lease. That's all you need. So, you know, in the discussion yesterday, 20, 30 page lease agreements are all, all, all good and well, but they're potentially just as easily reflected in a, in a single page summary document. And quite frankly, I've never seen other, other than an internal contradiction in the lease document, which one does occasionally see, um, I've never seen a problem with the nature of the occupation uh, by the time one gets as far as an eviction application. Okay. Yeah, I do think that um, 
lease agreements and tenants and inception might be a full discussion for, for another yeah. time, which maybe we can get I'm sure. some more people involved in order that. Okay, and then now when it comes to it, um, which we, you know, we discussed now what we can do prevention of the fact because prevention will be better than going to eviction, but when we don't have a choice, what is the process that a landlord would need to follow now? We've got a tenant, for example, let's use, use a, uh, uh, a hypothetical tenant. He's been there for three years. He's been paying okay. Um, December started to act to default. He owes 25,000 rand. He's not communicating. The landlord is um, dealing with a guy who's just not going to pay the rent. He knows he's not going to pay the rent. He's got four properties. 25% of his portfolio falls into this guy. What can he do? What is the first step? What can he do and what shouldn't he do? Maybe we start there. People often ask me, are there actions I can take that will result in somebody leaving property? And one has to be cautious um, with spoliation, et cetera, et cetera. And we, we might talk about that just now. Um, in truth, there's nothing much that, that a landlord can do that will undermine the eviction process. Um, let me rather talk about what one should do first. Um, the moment there isn't a rent payment, a breach letter should be, should be given. Now, obviously, again, we're now talking about normal times. Greg, I'm assuming just now we'll talk about abnormal times. Sure. Okay. Um, so normal times, you want to place that tenant in breach as fast as possible. Um, whether it's seven or 20 or 20 days, it doesn't really matter. That's the first opportunity for the tenant to come and make an arrangement, make a plan, get out of trouble. Um, then at the end of the breach period, one can then terminate the lease. And that quite frankly is another opportunity for the tenant to come and make an arrangement and avoid eviction because that's all most landlords ever really want they want somebody to stay there they want them to pay rent so there's two two separate engagements which are invitations to the tenant to come and talk to the landlord then of course if there's no talk or no um or no remedy then one institutes an eviction application which even that is another invitation to come forward and to make an arrangement you know i regard evictions as extreme debt collection in a way i mean there are circumstances where one will always want the tenant gone but those are few and far between in general terms you want you want the tenant to pay to pay the rental so he has several opportunities in this process to come and make good and to um and to ensure that the rent is paid an arrangement is made failing which one will go through the court process get an eviction order and evict that person um, you know, if, you, if one's concerned about things like services, we know that a lot of people do cut services, um, et cetera. And obviously the current discourse is very hostile to that. And I think what one is going to find as, as time goes by over the next months and years, that conduct is going to be increasingly criminalized and censured in the general trend towards um, uh, let's call it consumer protection type legislation, um, which is awkward because, you know, there's a, there's a perception, and I think it's a correct perception, that a tenant, while he's in occupation of your property, holds all of the cards and will hold all of those cards until the day he's evicted. And, you know, as we know, every day that that person occupies is a, is a rental a rental day lost to the to the landlord so it is problematic it is inevitable in the, in in a country with this with a history like ours um that the legislation is going to be consumer friendly but we are able to get eviction orders there's no impediment on on that barring evicting the very poor which can be time consuming um the the you know the courts are still quick to assist the landlord Sorry, the courts will still assist the landlord. It's not quick. It's not quick. You say that the quickest it will be is two to three months. I mean, two months plus an extra month. Um, you know, yeah. we can go up to nine months. Um, um, 
frequently tenants um, and their attorneys will use uh, delaying tactics in, in order to delay the process. And more attorneys like yourselves who specialize in evictions, they understand those, those quite well. Yeah. What do we do about that? Do we, do we let it run its course? Um, how do you tackle those? I must mention, of course, that it is possible to evict someone urgently if the situation arises, if there's a danger to life or property, if there's a hijack, if there's an invasion of your property. One can get eviction orders very fast if the circumstances warrant. Um, the, the attempt by opponents to delay is, of course, a real problem. The standard inner city tactic is to completely avoid the court process in its entirety until the date of last hearing, some two months into the process, to arrive at court and to um, you know, request time to oppose, which is invariably given at the, at the time of first asking. And it's very uh, frustrating, but this happens more often than not. My guess is that 10 years ago, that would happen in one out of 10 matters, now it happens in probably seven or eight out of 10. You know, there are, there are organizations that go door to door, handing out pamphlets, what to do if you're facing eviction, how to resist eviction. Um, and so we can assume that the inner city tenant is very sophisticated in, in how they will resist the, um, the process. So these are the tricks that will be played. Um, what we attempt to do, is to, um, is to front load our defenses to that if we envisage it's going to, it's going to happen. So the court will always give a, a, a postponement at the first asking, but if there's any hint of opposition, if there's any hint of, a, of an attorney, we will write to them up front, don't play this game, do not attempt to, to get this um, routine postponement, if you want a postponement, apply for one so that we can resist it. Unfortunately, many courts will simply give it, no matter what, they don't want to hear what we have to say. The system is resistant to evictions. Um, the system is uh, pro-tenant. So we will attempt to, to uh, prevent that delay. If it is delayed, we will have that um, tenant ordered to file an answering affidavit within a short period, 10 days, something like that. Because if they then fail, they've mostly used the one opportunity. We, we, there are horror stories where those opportunities roll on and on, but overwhelmingly having been given one opportunity, they won't get another one. So they either will join the process, go through an opposed uh, litigation process, or if they fail to comply with the court order to file, they will then, um, likely be evicted at the at the next occasion. The problem is, of course, that there's a lot of constitutional court um, jurisprudence that makes the court's job very difficult. And it's our job to try and minimize somebody simply trying to hit those buttons in order to in order to get uh, sorry about that, in order to get um, a, de a delay. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's a hostile environment, um, let's say. It, almost, it invariably results in an, in an outcome for the landlord. There are, there are no circumstances in which a landlord will be deprived of their property. Um, but getting there, the, the, um, the respondent has a lot of opportunities to, to cause delay. And of course, what we attempt to do at all of those is, is limit or prevent that. Okay. So yes, so, so that was part of my first question on this topic of what we can do now. Can the, can the landlord stifle that in, in a way? You know, if the tenant is gonna use, the tenant and his attorney uh, delay tactics, can I as a landlord do something stupid that would would give them uh, ammunition or power later to say, well, he said that to me, he switched my lights off, he, I don't know. No, uh, no, no. Um, I always say to my clients there, that none of that can impact on my eviction process. Um, people will attempt to use it, make no mistake, 
but in truth, it it won't have a bearing on the on the eviction process itself. Okay. Maybe let's say the let's say the court date is tomorrow, Friday the eighteenth, nineteenth of of June, and today client gets sick of it, goes in and throws the guy onto the pavement. The prospect is this guy could arrive at court tomorrow and say he threw me out yesterday. In those circumstances, it would probably cause a delay. It would probably cause a court to make an inquiry um, of of us what has happened here. But but no, other other than that fairly constrained circumstance, there isn't much that that a that a landlord can do that will mess up the eviction process. It's not to say that they couldn't get into trouble for some for some of their actions. That's a different story and a different question. So we try not to act too emotionally and we use you to, um, we use an attorney to take away the emotion from it and deal with things in a pragmatic way. Correct. I mean, if I may, my first reported case was back in, it must have been 96 or 97, before PI. Um, the old PISA, the Prevention of Illegal Squatting Act, and even you, you can see the ideological difference even in the name. Um, essentially allowed an, an owner to just throw someone out. So what happened was I instituted an eviction process for a, for a, a brickworks in Fairland. Uh, and we were going through the process and the owner got anxious and threw everyone out. So the legal uh, resources center, George Bezos, brought an application to reinstate them. And it came in front of um, a very esteemed judge who was one of the one of the the ones on the on the tax commission, and um, he was obliged to enforce the old legislation and didn't permit reinstatement, but was so cross that in the constitutional age, we were able to do this thing that he wouldn't give us the costs of the of the process. So, you know, it's it's. Uh, it's um, it was quite a quite an interesting experience for me, but very quickly taken over by Pi. Pi was initially intended for only squatters, um, but then the the Supreme Court of Appeal correctly found that um, why should squatters have more rights than a tenant holding over? So unfortunately, we are now dealing with that. And let me say, while I have the platform, people talk about oh, Pi must be amended. It'll never be amended. If it does, pie isn't the problem because the constitutional jurisprudence has so far moved our law that what's in pie is no longer relevant. And any attempt to change that is not going to assist the landlords, even if it happens. Okay. Uh, Greg, I sit on the, the side of the table here and it's uh, pretty for selfish reasons because I'm a residential landlord. And we often do speak quite a lot about residential properties and tenants. What, what um, if any, differences are there for commercial, retail, um, and industrial uh, tenants? Um, Essentially all the time, difference in the world. The, the, um, the pitfalls, the legal pitfalls that apply in residential evictions simply do not apply in commercial evictions. So, you know, you can literally, depending on how quickly you can get a court date, you could have an eviction order in commercial premises in three weeks. Um, there has been an attempt on the part of the anti-eviction NGO sector to suggest that those facing residential eviction also have a constitutional right to a place to conduct some small business. But that is the only element where the constitutional imperative potentially encroach, encroaches on the commercial or industrial sphere. In, in those spheres, it's out and out commercial fight on the merits, no, no weird and wonderful um, law, and the courts, as quick as they are to protect the potential rights of a, of a person facing residential eviction, have no interest, really, in, um, in protecting any particular party in a commercial eviction. Are there very they, use of that? So we're speaking now about, and I think most of the people involved here um, and participants are um, inner city 
uh, practitioners. So um, we've got a, a difference between a retail um, a retail tenant who owns 20 chains. A post the guy in town in Berea, he rents a small shop and during our lockdown, he's not able to pay his rent because he's yes. you know, going to visit. And he's almost subsistence. I mean, he, he profits maybe 20 grand a month and that goes to a salary and that pays for his normal rent yep. for his family. Would the courts see that differently? No. It wouldn't. Look, sorry, that's a, that's a very loaded question. In the normal course, not at all. Um, we haven't yet had the any opposed court consider this circumstance over over the over the lockdown. Now, obviously, the the issue at the issue at hand is the question of force majeure, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, which has all kinds of layers of complexity of it of its own. Um, but in general terms, there is no constitutional limitation on a commercial eviction. Now, in normal terms, in terms of PI, if a court grants an eviction order, it's obliged to grant a date by when somebody has to vacate. Now, that there's no such thing in a commercial eviction. When the eviction order is granted, technically, the moment you can get the order typed and served, you can instruct the sheriff to go and evict. Some judges will import the PI element into a commercial matter. So it's not impossible that a judge may say, this poor guy, you know, took strain. But that would be a major departure from our law, a major departure, and I don't think it will be made. Um, the fact is, is there payment? Yes, no. If the answer is no, there is no constitutional protection. Obviously, the sympathies are going to be with that individual who couldn't pay. Obviously, everyone's sympathy is going to be with that person. But there isn't any, that I can think of, any constitutional defense that that person could, could put over and, above, over and above the force majeure thing. And the force majeure thing has so many layers of its own that, um, that the, the blanket suggestion that you simply don't have to pay rent in that time probably can't be sustained. Okay. There's a question from a panelist, which I'm gonna um, add to a bit, and I understand what he's saying. So, if he's my example, um, as, as the question, I've got a tenant, I would say 10,000 grand, um, and he's paid three payments of 50 grand each. Um, and I told a friend of mine, he says, well, what he's doing is he's trying to defer it and say, as long as he's paid something, does that stand? If the tenant pays yeah. zero or yeah, is he on a better foot than he did no. Yeah. no. Look, what we haven't talked about yet is these weird times. And obviously, um, many landlords, especially those at scale, are going to be um, more forgiving than they might have been of legitimate attempts by tenants with a history of payment to make some kind of payment. You'll see, for example, some some landlords here and overseas have gone for the um, uh, rent the, the the turnover related rental in a in a way to to protect and assist their um, their tenants. If you pay one rand short of the lease amount, you are in breach. Now, the 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 complexity may come in is if someone is not paying you on the on the premise of force majeure, but their, their, their goods are on your property. They may, and I'm, I'm not a commercial lawyer, they may at some extreme edge of the conversation be an argument that they are paying for the amount of utilization that they are, that, they, that they've used, i.e. for the fact that you're storing their goods, for example. But I wouldn't, I w I'm reluctant to give a, a definitive answer on that now and unprepared because that is that is quite complex. So, in general terms, the answer is part payment isn't sufficient. Yes. So, the, so the way I see it, and you correct me if I'm wrong, with regards to a residential tenant, it's it's almost a black and white situation, a binary thing, whether in or they're out. Residential is completely binary, 
and there, there isn't any potential argument of, of force majeure, et cetera, et cetera, notwithstanding what some, some are trying to say. Uh, the fact is that the resident, residential tenant is in occupation of your property, therefore is obliged to pay for it. Now, whether you give them some latitude or not, that of course is up to the, is up to the landlord. But in, sure. in, there can be no argument. I mean, in theory, the argument in a commercial property is I could not conduct business. You could not give me the property that I let from you during this period as a result of, um, of the state of disaster. Therefore, I do, don't have to pay you for that. But it's again, it's, you know, my example was it's not that simple. Well, pay me for storage, pay me for electricity, pay me for your name on the, on the door. You know, and that I don't, one of my, one of my partners does that kind of work for us. So I'd rather, if, we, if, it, if it comes to it, I'd rather have him on, on, uh, online to talk about that than me, because my focus is, as you know, very much residential. Sure. So further to that question, um, and there's always discussions around this, if a tenant owes 5,000 Rand, can I load 1,000 Rand on the first of every month to his prepaid electricity meter? To, to pay the outstanding balance? The quick answer is I believe so. Um, the quick answer is I think it's a good idea. Um, the slow answer is somebody may make the case that that's a form of spoliation because of that load. I haven't seen it successfully done. And I've certainly heard of, of, uh, of landlords successfully doing that. I would say for present purposes, it's a good idea. Okay. As a practical example, okay. All right. Um, yeah, thank you, Greg. I think there'll be more questions for sure. you soon. Um, sure. I would like to ask Mark his view on, um, on a practical, um, his practical experience um, in dealing with the tribunal. I think the tribunal is good in, um, in terms of getting the, getting the ball rolling with a landlord who's, who's at a breakdown in relationship with the tenant and doesn't really know how to resolve it. The tribunal, I believe, is there to help people. We've had some success, but I would like to hear from Mark and uh, just get your view on just your few experiences with them and um, where you stand now with them. Okay, yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, can you hear and see me, Greg? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, just practically, you know, the, the couple of experiences we've had with the housing tribunal, one, initiated by the tenant, um, the other initiated by us, in both cases where the tenant hadn't been paying. Um, we just found the process quite fair. Uh, the, the hearing takes place after some exchange of, of notices and it's within a few days to a week. And they, hear, they seem to hear both sides. And where in the one instance where, they, where the tenant felt that the landlord was acting unfairly, um, the, the, the person holding the hearing, you know, sort of did agree with the tenant. But once they've done that, they turn to the tenant and say, well, why aren't you paying? And, and then the tenant is really on the spot. And it, it, it ends in, a, in a, an agreement being, um, being drafted. Uh, whether we, you know, eventually the tenant agrees that they do need to pay the rent, and they 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 write that up, and and we put in there to say like if you don't pay, you agree that we will serve notice and you will vacate. Um, and in both instances, the tenant paid for another month and then they stopped paying again, but then we had the order, and so long as you serve the notice to vacate on the first of the month, you know it it seems to be it seems it seemed to work well in both cases. The tenant moved out. I'm not too sure. I'd be interested in in Greg or Mark's opinion as to if they then breach it. But as I understand, the the order that they actually draw up and get signed is equivalent to an to the order of a magistrate of a magistrate. So once once they have then breached that, is that a sort of a good shortcut to then approach the the court again and say, right, you know, this is what the agreement was. They haven't. Uh, they haven't stuck to their side of the bargain. Can we now evict? And is that a quicker process to get that eviction order? But otherwise, the, I felt the housing tribunal did work. 
Um, you know, so, some of the tenants they know that they they they, they know all the tricks of the trade, but I, fa- I found the commissioners quite fair, and you know, they go according to the to the to the law. Um, so, and the law does state that you have to pay rent, and it does state that the landlord has to act fairly. Um, but once you've got that order, I think you've got something in writing that you can use, and and it, it did work for us. So, so your view is that we should be using the tribunal. It's not a hard thing to do um, to apply for. What should yes. you know? Yeah, you know, I, you know, I think I think the normal the normal process is that you send a letter of demand. You wait, you know, you wait the seven days that, that they have, you know, you put them in a breach for the month or the seven days, whatever it is, and and then and then you go again with okay, right now, you know, you still haven't you haven't uh, you haven't uh, fixed your breach, uh, and now we're giving you notice to vacate, and then you have the problem where the tenant doesn't vacate. Whereas I think with the housing tribunal. Um, you know, especially where, where the, where the tenant, you know, perhaps wants to stay or they want to work out a way and, you know, you get, you get a face to face, a face to face with them. Obviously it doesn't, I'm sure it doesn't cover all instances where you really have a tenant who's going to, you know, try every means under the sun to, to evade paying and, and not leaving. But, you know, I think if they don't say pitch to the hearing, you could probably get an order from the, um, again, Greg can maybe comment, you can probably get an order to say that, you know, they, they're in the wrong and you know, hopefully that is an, that with, with that you've got something that's, without having to go through a, a, a process of getting onto a court roll, an actual court roll, it seems to be a quicker process of getting something that's, that's more legally binding and I'd be interested to hear what Greg's view is uh, on, on using that to get a final eviction. Should I jump in, Greg? Yeah, yeah, look, I must say I accord completely with Mark's view on the tribunal. I find it very, very fair. I I, I like using it. Um, The the administration, the bureaucracy is is pro-tenant, but the tribunal itself is very, um, very fair. And we've almost invariably had a good hearing. You can't get an eviction order there. That's the only difference. The... Um, you, you're quite right, Mark. You can the order has the weight of a magistrate's court order, and you can you can issue a warrant of execution uh, on on the basis of it. But you can't um, you the mediation order that's sometimes made in terms of which it's agreed someone will vacate. You couldn't weaponize that into an eviction order. You couldn't go to the to the magistrate's court and have them issue a warrant of ejectment on that basis. Only the only the High Court or the Magistrates Court itself can issue an eviction order. But short of that, my uh, just a very quick comment: it's it, it's slow. Um, getting in front of the tribunal as a landlord is is slow, but very worthwhile if the issue is one of a conventional landlord-tenant nature. And I'm a big fan of the tribunal as well. Okay. Um, Greg, I think these these uh, questions would be more specific to you in this case, but Mark, if you can step in too and uh, give your experience, that would be great when you feel the need. Um, one of the questions is, uh, um, what do we do if tenants are going around the building, gathering support and telling the rest of the tenants not to pay their rent bill? We know what this is called, the rent strike now, uh, we, it's pretty been exacerbated by lockdown. But, to a large degree, are there charges we can lay against those those tenants specifically, or would you not get involved in that with regards to evictions? Do they have no? Um, look, the my specialist subject, for want of a better word, is a um, uh, is the inner city building hijack. That's really where I where I cut my teeth. Um, the if you start getting word, a, a, a hijack or a rental boycott will often follow a very familiar trail. Firstly, there'll be a a denial of ownership. Then there will be a call to pool resources, i.e. give us the money. We will make sure that everything's properly looked after. We will make sure the services are are paid, et cetera, et cetera. Then obviously collecting that money becomes um, irresistible and you start having rental collections by unconstitutional means. And that 
is how a rent boycott turns into a, into a hijack. Now, often you will have this, you will pick up word that somebody is going around saying, um, uh, don't pay your rental. Um, now, the problem in the first instance is quality of information because frequently people in buildings are scared. They will not give you a confirmatory affidavit to say, yes, Mr. Jones came to my room at 10 o'clock last night and suggested that I don't pay rental. So having that information, getting that information is, is unusual. What we do is we will, if this, if it comes, if it, if it starts emerging that this happens, we will write to the people that we believe or, or we have heard via rumor are doing this. And we'll say, guys, do not do this. You know, it's, it's, you're going to get into trouble. It is contrary to the landlord tenant relationship. And if, if it transpires that your call to arms is, is actioned, we are going to come for you first. So the idea would be in an ideal world, one would seek and obtain an, an interdict against that kind of conduct. Again, getting that information is tricky. What it may, if there's an uptick, if there's a, if, if people gang, gang up and eject your caretaker or your cleaning staff or your security, then you know, then you will get an interdict very, very easily. And that will then be a springboard into an urgent eviction application, which you, which you will want. So if you find that it's happening, you've got to confront it, even if you don't have all the ammunition, because people that are conducting themselves in this manner will often take fright at being put in the spotlight, being addressed by your attorney or by yourself to say, Mr. Jones, do not do this. We will evict you. And the courts will be very quick to assist you in those circumstances. So, yeah, uh, again, as I say, just a rumor of people doing the rounds. Tricky to get the inf information, but it must be confronted. Confrontation with the problem at source as soon as possible is always key in this kind of matter. So you must act quickly, is that what you mean? Quickly. Well. As quickly as you can. Because what you want is, if it's going down this track, especially in difficult times economically and especially in these times, a lot of people may join a rent boycott to see how far they can take it before it gets serious. In other words, they're not true believers. Um, so you need to, it's a battle for hearts and minds in, in, this, in the scenario that you've, that you've painted. People going around may be selling snake oil. We will force a lower rental. We will force no rental. And of course, it's going to be appealing. But you're, getting, you're going to get the action group then you're going to get the true believers. Then you're going to get the fence sitters. And any action you take is designed to keep the fence sitters from going down this line. So it's almost, there's almost a playbook in our office now. You know, attack the, attack the leadership group as hard as possible, as fast as possible, and do a, another less confrontational letter to the others to say, guys, do not go down this track. We have seen this movie before. Do not believe anyone if they're telling you you don't have to pay rent or you can pay 50% of your rent or whatever the case may be. You will get evicted. And this is where I really like the tribunal because what I say is if you have a problem, approach the tribunal. We can jointly approach the tribunal. Um, and the tribunal will, will hear your concern in circumstances that won't inevitably result in your eviction. Now, it may be something of a strategy on our part, but if there's a genuine grievance, let's have it out in front of the tribunal um, and not with the self-help. The un and, and we've got case law, that hard-won case law that says rent boycotts are unconstitutional. That is a big word. And it plays with great resonance in the courts. So um, you can't conduct, take self-help like that into your, into your own hands and the courts will resist it. Rather, as I say, if there's a problem, go to the tribunal, lay a complaint, we will join you.
and we will talk through what your issues are in circumstances where you continue paying your rental and you won't face eviction. But you have to act fast, you go in hard. So this might actually bring me to another question here. We've got, we've got two sides here. There's one tenant who's not paying his rental, we try to evict him. Then you've got the other side where the whole building's not paying or they've hijacked it. Is there a partial, is there a thing called a partial hijacking where you've got uh, 10 units in one building, five have hijacked that side of the building, we call it, and five are paying a property. Can you take, uh, I don't even call it class action, um, but whatever it might be, can you take a mass action against five tenants? Most certainly. In fact, I'm, I'm subject to correction, but I think I invented mass evictions in Joburg. Invariably, they were done before on an individual basis. Sometime in the late 90s, I figured, well, you know, why waste the court's time with 20? We'll, go, we'll, we'll do them all at once. And our court, I've, I've had problems in other courts because they're not used to it, but certainly our court is now used to it. Um, and it's much better because you, if you have a coherent problem, deal with it coherently. The courts prefer it because, you know, if there's a single issue, then deal with it in a single matter rather than a multiplicity that would otherwise ensue. So in answer to your question, you often find a group of non-rent payers and others that are continuing to pay their rent. And those are the ones in the first instance you are looking to protect, not only protect them as your tenants, but also to protect them continuing to pay their rental by them being aware that there are consequences albeit potentially slow consequences for those that don't pay rental. You know, and I mean, I hate to use the sort of such a, an aggressive term, but sometimes you have to deploy a balance of fear. Your rent paying tenants have to fear the consequences of not paying rent more than they fear those that are trying to foment a hijack or even a rental boycott. Okay. Another question. Um, so if eviction um, executions aren't allowed until the end of lockdown. And it's again, authorized by the court. It's authorized, yes. So, so I think the question um, uh, comes here as um, possibly because we're in a gray area still. Say, for example, the only time we can execute them would be next year. And you've got an eviction order, but you're waiting for lockdown to be finished. Is there any other recourse? Is there any, anything else we can do as a landlord that can force them to pay? I really don't think it's going to last till next year. I'd be very surprised if July comes without being able to evict, um, even at Cogta's um, pace. Um, we might have to force the issue, and it is something that we are contemplating if it, if it carries on. It certainly won't last till, till next year. But in answer to your question, um, I've got colleagues who, are, who believe in the rent interdict summons in terms of which one will attach a tenant's goods in, in anticipation of a judgment and obviously remove the goods once that judgment is, is taken. And some say that in so doing, you cause the tenant to take fright and to go. My own experience, certainly in the inner city, is that our tenants are too sussed for that. They just fight it out, they bat it out. Maybe in the periphery, maybe outside Joburg, maybe outside the big centers, someone will take fright and run if their goods are attached by way of a, of a um, rent interdict summons. So it, it can happen. Um, other attorneys swear by it. My own experience is that it doesn't really work. And the problem is we're in a, we're in a phase now where the public perception is you can't even bring an eviction application. You can't even terminate someone's right of occupation, which is not true. So people feel extra protected. They believe, I think, that they will bat it out as long as it goes. And then when the heat uh, increases too much, they'll either make a plan or, or move. Um, so we're in that phase. It's going to be a tricky phase. Um, hopefully, it won't last too much, too much longer. Good. I think we've answered quite a few questions there. I think we've got, personally, I've got some more clarity, like you say. Um, public perception is that there was no such thing as eviction during a COVID-19 lockdown, but you know, you've shed some light on the situation now and it's given me some clarity. I think our members and our participants have got, got a lot more uh, um, insight. Greg and Mark, 
Um, thank you for your time. I really do appreciate it. And I'm sure I speak for everyone here. Um, as Jay Bohm is con um, concerned, we, we are going to have more webinars. Um, they, we, we're going to do our best to keep them relevant. Um, but further to this topic, if, um, um, if any of our members or non-members um, have got more questions, direct them through Angela and we, we can maybe put them on our next webinar, maybe uh, send them on to Greg. Um, we'll try our best and I think we are, you know, it's quite clear that we're all in this together and uh, yeah, it should, uh, it should continue like that. Greg, so, may I say, forgive me um, for, for jumping in. I'm a big believer in an ounce of prevention being worth many, many pounds of cure. So um, Jay Poma members are welcome to call me. They will not be charged for advice. I don't work like that. I'll charge you if I do, if I do something for you. So please, if you have a question, a query, I've got nine colleagues here if, if I'm busy. Um, any question that Jay Poma members have, feel free to contact me to ask it. They will, you will not be getting a bill for it afterwards. Thanks, Greg. Thank you very much. And uh, um, Angela, thank you very much. Um, yes, good. See you in the next one, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you, panelists. Very informative and much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Take care, everyone. Be safe. You too.